Good. So please welcome uh, our brother Ron to come on stage. Uh, he will present the sermon today. I think you better wait clapping to the end, actually. <laughs> well, let's make sure this is on because I need it. Uh, okay. So. Who am I? What is my identity? You know, a couple of months ago, we heard Inga give a, a sermon and she expressed how working with some very difficult children. It was only when Christopher, our son, said, yes, it's difficult because they have no identity. And that, of course, changed the whole attitude Inga could take and to really succeed in helping these youngsters. So I'd like to start, though, with a reading from True Father. I'll read it for the people online. If the members of a family unite in true love, they automatically create harmony and unity. In this way, true love, true life, and true lineage are passed on through the generations. The grandparents convey the tradition of true love to the parents. The parents bequeath the same life of true love to their children. In their sibling relationships, the children take after their grandparents and parents by living for the sake of others and forming original relationships of true love. When this happens, that family becomes a heavenly family. Such a family may be called an original family or a true family. It is a family that fulfills God's purpose and ideal. <clears throat> Unfortunately, if even one of these components is missing, it is impossible to create an original family that can be a unit of the heavenly kingdom. So we have the carrot and then we have the stick. <laughs> So where should our focus be? That's the question. Some people may say, oh, we're an event organizer, which is true. We've all come back from Korea, and we'll hear a little bit more from David and Kyungja later. So yes, we do have events. But what is our main focus? I would like to suggest that if you are a man, your main focus is to love your wife and your children. And if you're a woman, your main focus is to love your husband and your children. It's the family where we learn the lessons of love. And it's then the wider world where we go to put those lessons in practice. So the family is the only institution created by God and it's the reason and it's the place where we learn, ideally, the lessons of love. But many people, you know, would argue, well, before I can love others, I must love myself. However, I think we need to be a little bit careful here. <laughs> because otherwise that can be misunderstood and we can turn very inward looking for our own personal salvation. You know, when we love someone, we create an energy. But that energy is shared. The love we give to others is received not only by that person, but it's reflected back in equal measure. You cannot love others without loving yourself. Likewise, if we don't love others, we're not loving ourselves. And we can find that we stay in that place that spiritual level. So, we have to love others. And I'd also like to um, remind ourselves why we must love our family and why we must love our spouse. It's not just to have a happy family. When we joined our church, whether we realized it or not, whether we accepted it or not, we took upon ourselves the responsibility of historical indemnity. And that indemnity and restoration goes back all the way to Adam and Eve. So for example, I married to Inga, who's German. 
That means we took on the responsibility or part of that responsibility to help two warring countries come together. So how do we help our ancestors who may be, yeah, they were in wars together. They may have resentments, they may be angry. They may have feelings which we know are very difficult to restore in the spiritual world. How are they to be released from that resentment? It's by, in our case, Inga and I loving each other. And as we find these feelings jump out at us, if we can love, despite those feelings, we help our ancestors restore themselves. You know, a couple of years ago, my father went to Spirit World where he met my mother who passed in 2006. And I would really like to believe that my parents can meet Inga's parents and they can party and the feelings of two world wars are just history. Yeah? When you look at Inga and me, do you see our love for each other? Do you think it was like that in the beginning? Well, I can say from my side, it was like Third World War. It was... <laughs> um, but that was the past, yeah? We had those irrational feelings coming up. But it is through loving each other we can restore those things. And 41 years later, we stand at today, and I really can say that our love is real. Yeah. So my point is that when True Parents brought us together, there was a lot behind that blessing. Things that I think, when I look back, I, I really didn't catch it in that moment, you know. I went to uh, New York and it was very interesting. When I went there, I didn't really know what goes on. <laughs> I'd only been in the church a short time. So I went through into the hall just I thought, well, let's go and find out what, how this works, what goes on. And I went in there, and I was sitting down, and all of a sudden, Father said, stand up. And we all stood up, a whole line. And as Father walked past, he grabbed me by the collar and pulled me out. And I just remember seeing this, this figure somewhere in a blue dress. <laughs> 20 minutes later, I was matched. And the rest, of course, is history. I'm sure you all have your own experiences. So God works through... Um, our spouse and there isn't I think there isn't a, a single person and that's for all of us who is able to bring us closer to God's heart than our spouse so uh, yeah family is important right I mean many people of course and I know that David and Kyungjoo and some of you have just come back from Korea and Champion and yeah we, we go through these uh, blessings, uh, ancestor liberation. And I, I was thinking about it, and I've been there once, of course, quite some years ago. And it's a beautiful experience, but I feel it's like, it's like a temporary reset where all our ancestral baggage is like just pushed aside. And we then have the freedom to change. But of course, the hard work starts, I believe, when we get back. When we leave Jongpyong, we come home. And if we don't maintain that kind of experience we had in Jongpyong, then of course, like Jesus said, seven times seven spirits come back. So we, it's incumbent upon us to change. So what is it that we must create in ourselves? Chapter one, first blessing. We must perfect our heart of love to resemble that of our parent God. Only then can we share in a heart-to-heart -heart way the fullest and deepest love that God wants to give us. And how do we do that? Creating a family of love. So what stops us loving? Any suggestions? Our sin. Our sin. It is our sin that blocks us from receiving the love of God has for us. It stops the blockage for the flow of love passing through us to our family members. So what is the value in knowing the principle? 
For me, it's, how can I put it? It gives us a standard and a reference. So when things come to me in my mind, I can judge it. Is that something that is in alignment with the principle or not? And if it's not, kick it out. You know, thoughts come to us from many places. And I think most of the thoughts we have are not from ourselves. I remember once doing a seven day workshop in Livingston House, one week of beautiful, pure atmosphere. And then when it finished, I had to go to Lancaster Gate. So I got on the tube. Oh my goodness, you're open, you're receiving, you just feel, oh my goodness, you know, this, the atmosphere, you could feel it. So well, many thoughts come to us. Yeah. So yes, when those thoughts come, we have a choice. Do I have give and take with that thought? If I do, I consciously make it a part of who I am. I have give and take with it. So we grow by the choices we make every single day, every second. It's up to us what we decide to fill our minds with. Yeah, whether you are destined for heaven and hell is not determined by your beliefs or thoughts. It is determined by your daily life. Just knowing in your head what is good is not enough. We think it's enough, don't we? But it's not. But our thoughts precede action. And like Father said, what's important is the standard of our daily life. I think it's, we, we all want to change the world, right? And members of our church, we feel we have a responsibility for that. But I feel it's only when, when the world sees ideal families that they'll really take notice of what it is we have to offer. Yeah. When a man feels love, the feeling is not generated by itself. It awakens in his heart because of a particular woman. Likewise, in the fire of love is kindled in the heart of a woman, not by itself alone, but by the man she loves. In other words, our love belongs to our partner. Thus, we must honor our father's love as being even, our partner's love as being even more precious than our own. You know, when I go to um, a local church in our village, it's Christian, it's called the Mariner's Chapel. And if you ask them, have they been saved? They will say, yes. The moment you believe in Jesus, you're saved. I'd like to just try something. Because the relationship we have with God is an emotional relationship, right? So, close your eyes. All of you, close your eyes. Quieten your heart. <clears throat> Stop thinking. And I'm going to ask you to ask yourself a question. And then I want you to feel your response to that question. Ask yourself, how close do I feel to God? How deep is the emotion that accompanies that thought? The depth of the emotion we love and feel, in a way, shows us how deep is our salvation. How close we are to God's heart. Now, keeping your eyes closed, do the same again, but ask this question. How close do I feel to my wife, to my husband? Okay, open your eyes. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that our salvation is complete only when we love God as God loves. Unfortunately, um, halfway through streaming on the Sunday just past, it stopped and all those online uh, weren't able to hear and see the second half of the sermon. Also, it means it wasn't recorded as we are streaming to YouTube. So I'd like now, for purposes of archiving the complete sermon, to continue uh, with the second half of the sermon. And I concluded that little part of the sermon with a sentence, <coughs> 
Remember, our salvation is complete only when we love as God loves. And in a previous sermon uh, at the end of last year, entitled, We Have the Capacity, We Have the Potential to Love as God Loves. God didn't create us to be inferior. He gave us a part of himself, an infinitely small part of himself. But the amazing thing with infinity is that an infinitely small aspect is as big as infinity itself. We have the capacity to love as God loves. But of course, it has to be realized. In the spiritual world, we don't have a body to hide behind. Our external expression is a direct manifestation of our internal world. And our emotions come to the forefront of our life. You can't look at anything without having an emotional response to it. You can't look at a tree or a bush or a flower without having some emotional response. And I remember quite some years ago I had a dream and in that dream I was able to perceive love itself and it came to me as a, a warmth. And I understood that the love that God wants to give me was limited by the love that I can receive. So God wants to give us the fullness of his heart and love. But we have to come to a position in which we're able to receive that. I'd like to give a simple analogy. Um, again, many years ago, I had a seven-day workshop and John Ralph was lecturing and I've used this example a few times probably because it had quite an impact on me at the time. He said our mind is like three rooms. In the first room everyone's invited but of course we only talk about the weather, what we saw on TV, what we had for dinner last night. But in that room there's another door in the corner that and it leads to a room in which we only let our spouse and our closest friends in. And there we begin to share what's going on inside of us, our feelings, our thoughts. But in that room, there's another door. And that door leads to another small room. And the only person we let in there is Satan. We don't even allow God to come into that room. And I think our religious life is all about restoring what's going on inside of us and to gradually get rid of those two secondary rooms so we have just one room in which we invite everyone except Satan where we're free to express all the things on our mind and our heart another quote I'd like to give is as religious people we don't look for results but opportunities. Faith is the belief that God works through us. It is not a belief system. It is a spiritual quality, I feel, that has energy and power. And I think the idea is simply to make things happen. I think Jesus meant that we're going to go around moving mountains. But it's a metaphor for believing that we can change fundamentally ourselves and through changing ourselves change the situation around us and I think when our faith develops and when that faith is coupled to a mind free from shadows free from doubts free from secrets it opens the door to our intuition and I feel it is our intuition through which God speaks to us. I can't actually say I've ever heard God speak to me with words. But when I'm in a state where I feel free, I feel open, things happen almost by magic. People turn up and say the right thing at the right time. Doors open. Um, 
yeah, you just feel that you're going with the flow and things are beginning to happen. You might be driving along the road on a beautiful summer afternoon. You look out of the window and you see creation. And you just start crying. You just you are just blown away by the creativity and the beauty of what's surrounding you. And it is an emotional response you're having. And sometimes that emotional response is so deep, it hurts here. You choke up. Physically, your body is responding to that deep emotion. And I'd like to believe that in the higher realms, this feeling of love is something that doesn't happen now and again, is a continuous way of life. We go from one emotional experience to the next, and it's amazing. So let's determine then between now and our next Sunday service, which will be in the last Sunday of July. Uh, this month of June, we have the annual gathering, so we'll not be having a Sunday service in Romford. And let's determine then to love our spouse and to love our children, to love our family, remembering that if we look in the Bible and if we look in our church history, all victories and all failures all center around relationships. The relationship between Cain and Abel, Cain unable to humble himself to his younger brother, he killed him. We have... Um, yeah, Judas and Jesus. Judas betraying Jesus. He failed to develop that artistic, loving relationship to Jesus. The result, Jesus was handed over to Pontius Pilate and he was killed. And we look at victories, um, Esau and Jacob. All to do with relationships. And that's why I guess what I'm saying in this sermon is that the key starts with the relationships within our family. We can have a mission that can end tomorrow. We can have a job where from one day to the next, we're given four weeks notice and it's finished. But the one mission that we can never escape from is the mission of our family. And it is, as I've tried to say through this sermon, it is through loving our spouse, especially when we have these negative feelings and thoughts that just come out of nowhere, to go beyond that and to love anyway, to try to develop a heart of unconditional love. And what does that mean? It means we are not dependent on the result. We are not looking for payback. We love regardless of the outcome. We then forget that we've loved and we move on to love more. And it's tough. <laughs> it is tough. We are all born from that first mistake by our first ancestors. You know, when I, um, for two or three Sundays of the month, I go to a local Mariner's Chapel, um, a free church, a very Christian. <clears throat> And they're always talking about how broke we are, how sinful we are, which, of course, I think really doesn't get us anywhere. But in one sense, it's true. And we're all on a path to come back to our original position. And I think the family is central to restoring this world. And it's only when... We see more and more ideal families, just as true father and true parents have expressed, that people will begin to see, yes, that is what we need. At the moment, I think we are all aware that there is a move by the extreme left. We generally call it the woke culture. 
It is a culture that is out to destroy the family. And it's up to us, I guess, to show a different standard. So the last sentence of this sermon is, solve the problem of the family and everything else will solve itself. When we have mass shootings, everybody wants to ban guns. But if those people who are traumatized and unhappy and resentful grew up in a loving family, I don't think they will want to shoot anybody. It is the family and dysfunctional relationships that cause people to get angry and resentful and do outrageous things. We ended the sermon actually by getting into pairs. If a couple was here as a couple, they would stay together. And for five minutes each, we just shared, who am I? What is my core mission? Thank you very much.